Welcome back to Talking Dragon Age, the show where I talk about Dragon Age. Today we're talking about this weird monkey toad statue thing. This pops up a few places in Dragon Age 2 and in Inquisition. I've talked before about how I don't put a lot of stock in reused assets. As in, I don't necessarily think every time we see something used in two or more places, it means anything serious. Like these guys who became statues, showing up as cake toppers and also in a dwarven port. But this stands out to me for a few important reasons. First and foremost, it appears out of place to me. Like, strip away everything you know about Dragon Age for a second, and just look at the environments. You can see a lot of influences from real cultures. Regardless of the real culture that inspired it, does it look out of place to anyone else? That's not a criticism, it's just something to be aware of as we go through the video. Before we get into the places we encounter these statues, let's analyze their appearance a bit. The mouth is open, and you can actually see the tongue inside, but it does not look like it's screaming to me, especially since the eyes appear to be resting, and it's in what appears to be a meditative position. The next interesting thing is that it's got four arms, two resting on its legs, and two folded in front of its chest. I looked for real-life meditation and yoga poses, and couldn't find anything that matched this particular position. And of course, there are these swirly patterns on the tummy and boobs. Spirals appear in cultures all over the world. At first, I thought they were individual spirals repeated three times. But it could also be that they're all part of one triple spiral. I can't think of any uses of spirals in Dragon Age except maybe some elven stuff, but I'll come back to its origin. The only other thing I could find with any similarity is this statue in Skyhold's Undercroft that has similar eyes. I'm pretty sure this was brought in with the Inquisition, but it's possible it was here from before. Let's talk about the places we encounter these things. Like most of the dungeons in DA2, we see this one a few times. But easily the most notable time it appears is at the peak of Sundermount, where Merrill's demon was trapped. I'll talk more about each of these locations in a minute. The next notable spot we see it is in the Legacy DLC, where it's used as a shrine to Demont at the bottom of Corypheus' prison. Then in Inquisition, it appears in a cave in the Western Approach, as well as at the end of the Knight's Tomb in the Emerald Graves. However, before that final room, we see engravings of the face all throughout the level. So let's take a look at each of these places to try to determine the purpose and origin of these strange statues. The oldest of these places is the tip of Sundermount, at least according to the demon, so we'll take that with a grain of salt. But allegedly, Sundermount was where the elves made their last stand against Tevinter's conquest. With what we know now, this wasn't necessarily the last stand of all the elves, but just the elves in this region. Anyway, the demon was bound to the idol here from the time of that conflict. It is unknown whether Tevinter or the Elves bound it here, let alone why they did it. What we do know is that the demon here is a form of pride, who had knowledge of the Illuvians, even how to make one from just a single broken shard. So I lean towards the Elves, however Tevinter won the battle here. At the entrance to the Sundermount site, there are these things that, to me, look Tevinter, but I could see it being related to Fallon Din. The only other place I know of where these things appear are in the Exalted Plains areas where the Freemen were raising the dead. So they're in the Dales, but it's also a Venatory plot, so that is completely unhelpful. The other notable thing about this place is that Sundermount is where Flemeth had to be revived from the amulet. I plan to talk more about this in another video, but consider. Why did Flemeth need the amulet to be brought here? Why Sundermount specifically? And why did she only revive once Meryl recited the rite for the departed? Again, I'll talk about the details of this in another video, but it's interesting that it needed to be here, the site of an ancient battle where an old, powerful, knowledgeable demon was bound within this strange statue. Just something to keep in mind. The second oldest place we encounter this statue is Corypheus's prison floor. The prison dates back to at least a few years after the first blight, though it's entirely possible that the main structure existed before that. The bottom floor of the prison actually connects to the deep roads via some tunnels, 
but it works just like the rest of the prison. It lets stuff come in, but not out. According to Janica's research notes, the original wardens carved tunnels from the rock itself. This line here is interesting, but I can't tell if the bottom floor of the tower was meant to be naturally occurring or not. This is relevant because why is this shrine to Demont down here? Was it here when they made the prison? Or did someone else bring it all in? We know Corypheus influenced the minds of a bunch of people, so it's possible somebody was drawn to do this. Let's look at the ritual for the shrine. It requires Dumat's crown, sacrificial dagger, ritual scroll, and sacred urn. They're all placed on the altar, and completing the ritual, which involves a prayer to Dumont, gives you a reward. But defiling it means you have to fight a bunch of demons. We always have to keep in mind the unreliable narrator, but let's assume this is what actually happens. My theory on this is that whether it was already here, or if someone under the influence of Corypheus made it, or brought it here, the demons were bound here just as a safeguard, or punishment. The reward was just magic associated with Dumat, but not Dumat himself bestowing any gift. In any event, the shrine is dedicated to Dumat, that much is certain. So finally we come to the place where it's featured most prominently, Dinan Hanin, Tomb of the Emerald Knights. Best I can tell, this was the resting place for the Emerald Knights before the Second Exalted March, while the ones that fell at the end of the march were buried beneath the trees of the Emerald Graves. We see the full thing in all its glory at the end of the dungeon, but we see its face engraved all over the place before, featured prominently in what appears to me like some kind of reception area, as well as these other large chambers before reaching the final chamber. Dinan Hanin is a tomb, so we can reasonably associate these things with Falun Din, god of death. But Falun Din already has other statues that represent him. But remember how I said there was another in the Western approach? Well, it took me way too long to find it again, and I thought it was the Lost Idol landmark. But instead we get this thing. The landmark says it depicts worshippers of Razakhail, but what's this? Why are the lids of these Danish sarcophagi the same as this obelisk dedicated to Razakhail? As I said earlier, the easy answer is reused assets, not canonically the same thing. But it's weird, right? It's worthy of note. But that last location in the Western Approach, it's actually called The Thing in the Dark. This is... this'll take a minute. First things first, wax candles here are still burning. Someone was here recently. Then we got these things that look like graves. Nothing on them, even with Veilfire, but they're arranged in a circle. This is a shrine. The landmark note says the statue is warm to the touch and shivers like it's alive. Looking closely, we see some kind of red stuff on it. Could be blood, or could be wax from the red candles. Oh well, I guess we'll just leave this alone then. No need to investigate further. Don't mind us, cultists. Didn't mean to disturb your shrine. Seriously, we don't get any reaction at all for this. Why not? So yeah, there's not much more to say on this. What do you guys think? Who set this up, and why? So we got one place that connects the statues to the elven gods, probably Falun Din specifically. We got one place that connects them to Dumat, one of Devinter's old gods. And one place that connects them to either the elves or Devinter, and it was used to hold a powerful demon with knowledge of the Alluvians. At the entrance to that site, we get these things that could also be Tevinter or Elven. So that's unhelpful, unless anyone can find them somewhere else. Also, the lids of the sarcophagi in Dinan Hanin are the same as an obelisk dedicated to Razakale. So what can we tell from all this? Well, not much, actually. At best, it supports the theory that the old gods are connected to the elven gods, perhaps specifically linking Dumont to Falun Din, but I still think it's a weak connection. So I guess there's not really much left to say. These things are weird, and we don't know the precise origin of them. 
It served both as a shrine to Damat in Corypheus's prison, and as an elven shrine in Denan Hanin. So what do you guys think? Be sure to let me know in the comments section. Before I go, I want to give a special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon, Girl Tries Games, Lev Saban, Katie Louise, and Casveria. Thank you guys so much. So that's it for now, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to comment and like, and remember, tala nadas.